Guys, welcome to another edition of Founder Wisdom Podcast. We have Dave Edwards with us. He is co-founder at uh, Sonder Studio, co-host at Artificiality, which is a cool pod, and uh, also angel investors at Koru Ventures. Dave, welcome to the pod. Super excited to have you here. Can you give us a brief intro about yourself and Sonder? Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, nice to be on this side of the mic. Um, so we, uh, Saunders Studio, we are um, uh, in the business of collective intelligence of humans and machines in a complex world. So what does that mean? That means helping uh, people work better with machines. It helps, it means designing machines that are better for humans. Uh, we're very, we've been involved in the AI space since uh, 2015. So we have a long history of, of sort of planning for this crazy moment that we're all in now. Uh, mm -hmm. with generative AI going bonkers. Uh, we've been waiting for this for a while, so it's been nice to be prepared. Um, functionally, we have a uh, we provide research um, uh, through a membership subscription. Um, so uh, that is designed for leaders to really help give them um, actual, practical, provocative research about how to think about people and machines together. Uh, we do strategy and we do design work. So we work with companies to um, create products that are built around and use AI. Uh, uh, and we run educational programs. So we'll come in and do change management for your organization to help you figure out how to use these things, how to think about it, how to make better decisions with data, how to solve complex problems, um, those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. So it's been a it's a it's been a fun ride, and it's suddenly gotten very busy, which is good. <laughs> I want to give the audience some contents because you've got a fascinating background, and I feel it's essential to cover that. Um, you started as a research analyst at Morgan Stanley. Uh, you covered Adobe, uh, EA, this is crazy, Intuit, Microsoft, Netscape, VeriSign. I mean, that that's a huge start. And that was in the dot-com uh, boom era. So tell us about yes. the insights and how that propelled the rest of your career. Sure. I, I joined Morgan Stanley in sort of in 1998. I'd come out of a few years of working as a product manager at Macromedia, a software company that was um, sort of the, the big dog in what was the multimedia era. So we made software to help people make um, CD-ROMs, and then we transitioned into creating products for the internet, uh, like Dreamweaver. Um, and uh, I worked on a handful of products there, Shockwave. I worked on Final Cut Pro, which came back in my career later on. But I went to Morgan Stanley, and I got very lucky to take, get a job working with uh, Mary Meeker, who was dubbed queen of the internet. And... Um, uh, I covered the sort of the software and infrastructure, um, internet infrastructure side of the house for her. Um, and the real big thing I'd say from now as a takeaway is that when you go through these massive transition times, it's very easy to become myopically focused on the thing that just happened today and think that that's the thing that you have to address and that's the thing that's going to make or break your future. Um, and because these technologies transition over time, things happen, they change, um, how we use them changes and evolves. And so I'd say the reflection for now is I feel like we're at that very early stage of the commercial internet. We now have technologies that are actually able to help us work through things. You have a window into a, a huge large language model, um, or otherwise in, in broad category, a foundation model. And that window is called ChatGPT. And uh, it's an extraordinary, exciting thing, but everybody's spending their time trying to figure out prompt engineering, which is a little bit like what it was when everybody tried to figure out how to code HTML. Um, back in the day when you created a website in BB Edit, um, eventually tools came to abstract the process. And so you'll see more and more tools built on top of these foundation models that give you more, uh, more of a tool-based access to AI rather than a code-based access. Um, so I think it's a fascinating time to truly try to understand how these models work. But I would say one, one important sort of strategic opportunity, but also caution is to remember these things will change rapidly. So um, be uh, allow yourself to say no to things because it may not be the right time to build on something in particular and take on that tech debt long-term. Yeah, there's so much noise right now, like, prompt engineering people claiming to make 375k per year which i think is total bs um and and then 
you know, people claiming to be prompt engineers, while it's mo mostly it's ChatGPT just doing its thing, trying to understand that uh, silly human that doesn't know exactly what to say. And that that's me, that's the most fascinating part. You know, it's ChatGPT truly understanding what you mean when you can't explain yourself correctly. Um, I'm not sure if it's like coding and how deep you can get obviously well me my my thesis is that you can throw a bunch of ideas to to chat gpt and, and try to see if it sticks like hey can you be uh tony robbins for a moment or a mix of tony robbins and richard branson uh or have this round table for advice so there, there's so many use cases and there's so much noise right now that i think and i've read an article about that yesterday about um ai engineers not knowing necessarily where to give their attentions there's so many scoops there's new product deployments on a on a daily basis almost let let's stick to this as an entrepreneur where should i place my tokens and where should i not place them should i place them on, on chat gpt uh should i uh, build uh apis uh on that should i focus most of my time generally speaking in ai and where should i not uh, focus my time is a question I have for you. I love the dual use of the word tokens. Where should they place your tokens, both as a bet, but also with, in terms of the way these large language models work, it's all based on generating tokens. So um, I, I'd start with the, to, to us, the premise, the most important part about what the, what's happening right now is the emergence of what's, uh, what's described as foundation models. And we've dubbed this layer, the AIOS. So the, the OS of the AI age. And that I think is the most important thing to start with when you're thinking as an entrepreneur is how do you want to interact with that operating system? So think about that as the operating system that doesn't connect you to the hardware as a traditional operating system, but this is the operating system that connects you to the data of the world. If you're looking to build something that is proprietary to your data, then you may still be in the world of creating your own AI models because there isn't a foundation model that actually serves that purpose. That will change over time, however, for a lot of applications because there's new foundation models being developed. So we now mostly focus on the language and the image and the multimodal, right? So language and image, but you're seeing audio, you're seeing video, and you're starting to see some conversations around things like um, uh, uh, spatial uh, you know, models, um, you're seeing um, particular um, market space models like the Bloomberg GPT that's been that they've that they've put out. So you see a lot of different opportunities to think about how to interact with that. Um, I think that working through Chat GPT is like working through any other application that sits on top of the OS. Chat GPT is just an application, a really simple simple one that sits on top of GPT. You too could create a Chat GPT window that sits on top of GPT. Right, that that's that's possible. You could also make an application that works with GPT, that works with Stable Diffusion, that works with Midjourney, that taps into multiple functions of foundation models. This is not necessarily as easy as it is now as it will be in over time. But if you think about these functions, these are more like you're calling to the OS. So rewind way back to the beginning of my career in tech, we were developing you know complicated applications that were doing uh, you know breakthrough things with the operating system so final cut pro was was you know led the way in terms of um uh, uh create editing video at a high resolution on the on a desktop that meant complicated calls to the os to handle the video the audio all of the other at all of the other sort of calls we were making um and that's a similar kind of relationship that an entrepreneur i think will be able to have to these foundation models in the future so I think what it really is, so rewind back and just sort of summary is think about this as a new application layer and think about what kind of role you want to play with that application layer. So plenty of people are making quick little applications on top of the foundation models. That might be great. That might be a good opportunity. It may also be something that just gets you know blown away by somebody else. The other problem is thinking about whether the foundation model you're using is the one you want to be attached to long-term. So you're developing something that goes to GPT. Well, why not cohere, right? Why not one of the other models coming out of the you know, major tech companies? There's lots of different large language models that exist today and more that will emerge over time. And so that makes for a very difficult decision to think through. Yeah, it's rocket science 
going on in my brain. It's like, oh, should I start my own cohere, my own uh, LLM? Should I get that moat? Um, and if I do, well, I probably need capital because it's a race against time and it's I need to deploy humongous uh, quantity of energy uh, to do that. If we, and me, I'm an open AI nerd. I've been studying them quite a lot, probably spending 7% of my energy brain studying their business model uh, lately. And if, if we start from when it, it, when the, the company was born, it's it, you need to start with Y Combinator and Sam Altman spending a lot of time there. So really having his own little lab and testing out what uh, what product works with what market. So he has a PhD in, in product market fit, I guess, and how to run a startup. And then the second thing he did is unite this team of elite AI people, put them in one room and let them work for a good five years. It wasn't an overnight success. Um, and doing that is is heroic. It's like climbing probably 100 Everests uh, in my mind. Like, how can I unite all these AI people? Oh, they'll, they'll probably charge uh, 250K per year, each of them, plus ask for some equity. Also, what I'm starting to understand in Altman is that he's not motivated by money, uh, but impact, which is super interesting, um, he's like really next level. I think he that he doesn't have like uh, shares in open AI and talks about UBI and all all of these kinds of topics, which we will get into. But for for me, a capitalist, rationalist human, I'm asking myself, what how should I play my my pieces on on this chessboard right now? Um, I think that the lowest hanging fruit for me would be because I'm I'm a strong believer in bootstrap. Uh, bootstrapping and and having my freedom uh, over decisions and equity in my business, I think would just be connecting um, in in these uh, languages and using the API for now, and probably starting one of my favorite uh, business model, which is an aggregator. You know, so it's like uniting all of these models together. And because the the main problem with business nowadays is that there's a hundred companies doing the same thing, and that confuses the consumer. Although I, I would go. Um, with B2B. So um, with all of that um, information set, and last piece I want to add to the puzzle, which will lead to my next question is, why is this important for, for me and a bunch of other entrepreneurs is that this AGI thing might even crack the whole capitalist code and might make money not obsolete, but it might make it a, a thing of the past. One of the core problems with society nowadays is that capitalist, uh, capitalism uh, overrides a lot of the ethics, you know, like most people are working for money, not because they like it or that it adds value to the world. The greatest example is nine to five, probably 85 to 95 percent of humans are stuck into this. So which means that if I if I want to have a shot at cracking this and getting getting paid and um, potentially adding humongous value to humanity, I need to get into this right now. So the question is, well, uh, try to crunch all the data that I, I provided there, but do you think that in 15 to 20 years, we're going to see AGI and how is the landscape going to look? Um, so far, in my mind, it looks like uh, OpenAI is going to be this multi-trillion dollar company and maybe there's going to be Google in the race and these companies are, are going to even provide some kind of UBI check uh, to humanity, probably to US first. And then to other countries, what do you think about that that future? Big question. Okay, yep. so uh, first of all, I think it's hard to, I, I find it difficult to say when will AGI happen, mostly because there is no common definition of AGI. So even if you ask Sam what AGI is, he wouldn't give you a very you know crisp, clear answer. Um, and some of that has to do with the fact that we're comparing it with intelligence, which we don't really have human intelligence. We don't really have a, a concrete answer for that either. So picking a timeline of when AGI is, is a difficult thing because you first have to agree on what the actual definition of AGI is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways though, AGI, we already have it, right? I mean, there's a, there's things that are coming, that are emerging in GPT-4 that are general. Uh, uh, GPT-4 is able to, um, to take learnings from one domain to another. Um, and some of the trans the transference like um, is increasing accuracy when it's dealing with with these sort of multimodal. So th those are quite unexpected outcomes, and they are things that we don't understand. 
um, the researchers don't understand. We don't know why that's happening. So in some ways, I just sort of stop and think a little bit like it's already here, right? It's already happening. Now, What, how intelligent does it become and how generalized does it become and what kind of economic you know, impact does it have? We have yet to know. A lot of that has to do with how we will deploy it. Now, in the end, we generally don't have a lot of things where we completely defer to the machine. There's always some human involved. There's always some human who's responsible. There's always some human who is accountable to investors, who is accountable to the law, right? We don't have, we can't just sort of say the machine will do it all. Perhaps we completely reconstruct all of our societies around the world and we allow a machine to do everything. I'm not so sure that that's going to happen in that period of time, but you know, I'm a forecaster as a career. Um, and I'll tell you one thing that's for sure is all forecasts are wrong. Um, it's only whether it's helpful and useful. Mm. I will say, I think that the um, it will have um, pretty dramatic impacts um, over some time frame. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, had a, I, I can really pick it because I think we're just kind of picking numbers out of the hat. GPT came on um, faster and stronger than we expected. Mm. So it's hard to know whether that pattern uh, of, of improvement will, will um, continue or whether it will change. It could get slower, it could get faster. We just don't know. A couple of basic principles though that I put out is um, one, um, OpenAI will not be alone in this in this um, in this development. Um, uh, they happen to be kind of first along the block, but they certainly won't be alone. There's the other major tech companies. There's some uh, very well funded startups. There's a decent number of open source projects. Um, uh, there is um, uh, plenty of people can do what they've done uh, given the right number of resources. It will be some level of you know, minor players or number of players, just like it is in the operating system market, right? These things come and go, um, just like it was in the broadcast television market or in, you know, even as we got into more open worlds of cable and streaming, there's only a certain number of major streaming partners. There's a certain number of platforms that generally exist in most markets. There aren't a lot of things that change there. There's major platforms in pretty much every new media or medium um, and uh, that has tended to be a, a, a consistency. That was something that that um, Mary Meeker put out quite a lot early on in the er internet days. And we looked at that at every different segment. The biggest challenge we had that I say the, that the comparison is in the internet space, it was hard to determine what a, uh, a space was, what a domain was. Would there be three you know, pet delivery businesses and grocery delivery businesses and um, news businesses about finance or whatever it was like, or would it be three news businesses and three delivery businesses, right? We didn't know how to, how to, how to compartmentalize them in time in, in, you know, as it was developing, that's kind of similar. Now we don't know whether there will be um, one, uh, whether there'll be a few major large language models or whether there'll be a few major generative AI models because they all become multimodal and they come together. Or maybe it's a platform that strings the things together like an operating system does. There's lots of complicated you know, processes that happen that are all wrapped up inside the Mac OS, for instance. So I'd say that one is that there's not gonna be just one player. Um, I think the other thing I'd think about is, um, a, is a core principle that um, I definitely took on board pretty heavily when I worked at Apple, um, which was quite a long time ago, but it was it was an interesting and unique time, is one of the basic principles from Steve was always that um, you had to be starting with the customer's problem. Uh, don't start with the technology and look for a solution. Look to figure out what the problem is and go back to the technology. And right now, what's happening is generally the world is rushing towards a solution. It's a technology looking for a solution. Wow, there's this large language model. I can put, I can access the API, and then I can do this. I can spit this thing out. And you stop and go, hmm, was that really a big enough problem to really address? Did I start with something that I thought was actually a material problem? Or am I just finding some cool little trick that I can do? And the, under, the important part of that is if you start with the trick, the cool thing that you think you can do with the technology, you may, you're, most of the time, you know, you're not actually solving the true problem because you haven't thought through what the overall use case is for what people need. So think about people who are coming with lots of writing assistants, little, little ones, right? Um, summarize my blog post, um, uh, write me an email. Those are helpful, um, but are they the right solution for the user? 
Is it going to be them? Am I going to go to a tool and, and create an email and then copy and paste it? Or is that actually just going to be something that's going to be sitting in my email provider? Am I, do I want to have a blog summarization tool that I go to as a URL, put my blog post in and get a summary back? Or is that just going to show up in Webflow for me? We run on Webflow. Like that should be something there. That's an obvious thing. Do I want to summarize my meeting notes by taking my meeting notes and putting it in chat GPT and getting a summary? Or is it just going to happen because I'm going to press summarize in Notion where I capture all of my, my emails, right? Where's the workflow? Where's the problem? What, what, where is the pain point that the, that the user is actually happening, having? That's where you start with to go back and solve the problem, right? Um, but it's really hard with these general purpose technologies. This happened in the internet day too. We suddenly you could create a .com and there was a lot of crappy websites that people created just because you could, but it didn't do anything for anybody. It wasn't actually advancing anything. It took a while for people to figure out what to do with this new thing. And we'll go through that journey with this too. It's just, it's happening quickly and it's happening much more loudly than it ever was. There was a very small number of people actually on the internet in 1995, um, a fraction of who the number of people that are using ChatGPT today. And that's pretty remarkable. So that's why it likely feels really crazy and likely feels like, oh my God, I have to do something or I'm gonna be left behind. Remember another guiding principle from Steve, well, the most important thing you can do is say no. Um, one of the things he prided himself on is the number of things we said no to. And yeah. I think that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind right now. Yeah. Like you said, we're kind of intersecting at so at the center of so many topics and, and signs here. Sometimes I, I wonder to myself, you know, is this all a simulation? Because it seems like we're at the right place at the right time. You and I, you know, like mm -hmm. how odd would it be that we, we might crack immortality, we might crack AGI in the next 20 to 30 years, you know, and we're part of that, which is very weird. Um, for, I mean, and this this podcast, I, I love to be sparring with brains like you because I can throw a bunch of ideas and not even follow up with a question just to know your thoughts. It's like, it's literally like chat GPT in, in some sense. Um, the definition of AGI, I think, uh, the, the real definition is is something that would understand this reality. But the thing is, us humans, we cannot even, even if uh, Chad GPT would tell us that this is the reality, us human brains would probably not be evolved enough to understand it, which is a, an odd question, right? Which is why I think a, a top tool um, that could be developed mostly for research application could be something that could explain the thought process of AI and how it got there to explain to our human brain and kind of have our, our human brain digest the information better. And obviously there's a bunch of um, brain augmenting technologies that are gonna be developed and gonna intersect, which is why it's gonna be uh, exponential like uh, Kurzweil says. Um, and then I'm, it got me wondering, well, when AGI is gonna be a thing, I think as humans, we're gonna focus way more on EQ and the heart, you know, not the brain so much. Maybe that's what we're really good at as humans. I'm going on a retreat this week. And as a very cerebral guy, it's always been a challenge for me to, to bring back the heart in the equation. This is going to be a, a drastic old uh, world. And then I got another thought, which is, I think AIs, the use of AI is only going to be legal after 18 years old. Plus, it's going to be like alcohol because you don't want to influence a, a brain at this age that's moving that much. Although the neuroscience is interesting thing. Um, but the thing with AGI, which is another uh, definition of it, is its ability to to achieve your own objective, right? Uh, to put it to work to reach your own objective. And you, you need to be careful to select these objectives. And then it comes with, with the question of of destiny and of, yeah, if, if there's, I forget the, the specific word for that, but if everything is predestined in your life and if your parents put some ideas in your head, and then AGI kind of multiplies that and gives you more of what you want, but what you want is not li literally what you want. That will be a very tough uh, ethical challenge. You talk various times about Steve. Uh, Steve was yet yeah, a, a legend. He was a very interesting brain. Uh, did you had AI conversations with Steve? Would you often talk about that or was it mostly product and uh, consumer uh, conversations? Uh, I was there before it was too early 
right? So I was there in the early 2000s. And so I was there in the era when we were creating the, the iApps. I was in what was called the applications group. Um, and so this was creating iTunes and iMovie and iPhoto um, and the professional tools, Final Cut Pro, which Apple had acquired from Macromedia uh, and a variety of other tools that, that, um, that, cre that focused on the professional media market. Um, also on my uh, team was Keynote and all of that suite. Uh, GarageBand was an interesting time, but it was before what we would have really thought about as AI today. Uh, there was definitely what you would have considered AI at times. So we had some sophisticated image technology inside of Final Cut Pro um, and some of it in some of the consumer apps, but it wasn't what we're dealing with today. So it wasn't a topic of conversation um, in, in that kind of way. Um, and he unfortunately passed before it really became a big thing. So, you know, I don't know, it's hard to know what he would have thought of it, right? And what he would be saying at the time and what he would be saying about how to think about how to think about it. Um, I would say that I think there is, there's one reflection though, which is, um, you know, I, I open by saying that we focus on collective intelligence of humans and machines. And I think that's important because, you know, think throughout your life of, you know, people that you've worked with who you just thought were just really brilliant, you know, Steve, um, Mary Meeker, like people, the, the highlights, you know, lots of people that I studied with in college. I just happened to, you know, get lucky and, you know, and people throughout my career in wicked smart ways in different ways. My my partner and wife, Helen, is is ridiculously brilliant. And she digests science in a way and translates science in a way that is truly um, special and unique. But all of those people have are wrong at times, right? And I can tell you stories about when all of those famous people or not famous people have been wrong. And where we got to a good decision was through some sort of collective pursuit. Right. So even when the smartest brain you've ever known walks into that room, that group of people that you're sitting with doesn't just defer and say, yes, okay, fine. That's the way it'll happen. Right. Um, if that was the case, guess what? GarageBand wouldn't even exist today. Right. We had to rebel and it was a skunk works project to make that thing happen because the powers that be were good saying no, right? So you, you, you end up with good outcomes because people actually make decisions as groups of people and don't just defer to one intelligence. And I think that's really important to think of when we think about these intelligences today, when we think about what might become more intelligent and more generally intelligent, just because the machine says the answer is 42 doesn't mean that you're actually gonna say, okay, we'll now put $42 million on that project. Mm. That's one input. It's one idea. It might be a really, really important one, but it's one of the powers that we have as humans is we put things in context. We're able to see things and understand things that are unpredictable, especially things that are future focused and that are novel. We've actually evolved to do a pretty good job of taking what we've learned in one context and go to a new context and be able to apply that and be generally pretty good at it. That's a really, really difficult thing for a machine to do. Yes, yeah. it's getting better. And yes, it will get better. But when you stop and think about all the decisions you have to make, how many of those are ones that are purely defined by the data that has existed in the past, right? And can be applied through a machine versus how many of them do you think you look at that and you go, yeah, but this time I think it's going to be just a little bit different just a little bit. So I'm going to take that input from you machine and I'm going to do something slightly different with it just because, you know, I because I've gotten an interesting feedback from from one of my clients about the last time I ran a marketing campaign, you know, and I think that 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 unique experience that that person had kind of applies to this one that I'm working on right now. Now the machine wouldn't see that necessarily, right? Um because it just doesn't have that it's that's not what it's good at. So early on in our journey, we started, I said, we started working in AI in 2015. One of the things that we came up with, we started talking about AI as a machine employee, which almost breaks one of our rules of anthropomorphizing, which we hate doing, but we wanted to give people the, the idea that this is to consider this an employee, to think about what it is to have these machines that need to be coached, that need to have governance, that need to have improvement plans. You need to have annual reviews. Is it still working right? Is it doing what you want it to do? When is it going off the rails? Because no matter how powerful these things are, we always have to make sure that they're actually working for us, hmm. not that we're working for them, 
right? Yeah. And so thinking about that as an intelligence that's part of your team, not something that's going to be the God that we will always say yes to. Mm. By the way, there is definitely a religion aspect to people's fascination with AGI. Oh, yeah. And there are definitely there always thinking, have been, you know? Oh, yeah. They're thinking about creating, you know, they're thinking about creating a God. And Sam Altman is the high priest, right? He's creating a new religion at OpenAI. And, and, and his models will be a God. And he's expecting us all to follow it, right? I know, yeah. That could be quite successful because humans, we have... Um, over our, the lifetime of our species, we have shown a remarkable ability to fall for and follow the supernatural yes. of all kinds, of all stripes. We follow gods we're and lost, singles you know? and many gods. We're lost. We, we're scared. Uh, we have yeah. emotions and we're, most of us, we're, we, we're made to be led, you know? It's very few that the real yeah. leaders that guide uh, people, uh, Jesus being the prime example, you know, Jesus was probably uh, a very good entrepreneur, a very good salesman. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the, I mean, he he preached, you know, went from city to city. And then there's this godly aspect to it, which is so fascinating in so many aspects. Sure. And, uh, and these they, machines can feel sort of godlike at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, you can feel it. Me, it's not Altman. of uh, if anything with God, it uh, might resemble more Elon, but because he's such an impressive individual too, but we've seen his flaws lately <laughs> quite a lot, but it's mostly with, uh, with chat GPT itself. You know, I, yeah. I very much treat it like a human and a peer, uh, not like a machine, you know, because it, it rivals with my own intelligence. Um, and that, yeah, oddly enough, that's how I give my respect. Um, mostly the, the question is, should should I or not? Uh, but yeah, that's that's why I kind of uh, give my respects to it and treat it politely. Um, Dave, it's been like a pleasure to have you on. We need to do a round two because yeah, 30 minutes, definitely not enough. And I'm 10 minutes late to my next call. But yeah, it was worth it. Where can people find out more about you? So Saunders Studios, uh, getsaunders.com. Uh, you can find stuff about there. Um, check out our insights for the things that I mentioned before in terms of presentations on foundation models. Uh, we've got another one coming up today. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, hit me up. I'd love to connect with people. Um, Artificiality is the podcast. You can find that on all your podcast channels. We publish it through Substack. So you can also subscribe there. We do long form interviews with um, authors and academics and practitioners in the in this general space that we're talking about the intersections of humans and machines. Love it.